This episode of Grilled is sponsored by Rationale, your leading provider in multifunctional hot food preparation equipment. Register now for a free Rationale live demo at www.rationale-online.com. Welcome to Grilled. I want to eat under roast whenever I want to eat under roast, not when you want me to eat it. I just remember Brad's smell of his beard. You just had the biggest, fluffiest beard, and I was like, God, he smells so good. <laughs> I don't know why, it's weird. Sometimes you put smell or something to it, and I just remember that, of course, a bit bizarre. Why are you in your chef's white cellar? Are you working? I'm cooking burgers. <laughs> oh, burgers. <laughs> I hope they're not McDonald's. And I just lash it all over the hot toast as it melts and quickly match it up, crunchy, crunchy, munchy. Dying to get like a piece of your culinary penis in or around <laughs> their mouth. Welcome to Grilled, a podcast by The Staff Canteen. I'm Cara, editor of The Staff Canteen. And this is the second episode with my co-host Stephen Edwards from Etch in Brighton. He's also a former MasterChef Professionals winner, which is why the next uh, six episodes will all feature previous MasterChef contestants or judges. Um, so, Stephen, how are you? How are you this week? I'm really good. Things are settling into a nice rhythm down at the restaurant. So it's back, back to normal, which is always nice. Yeah. Did you do anything for Halloween? Um, the kids went trick or treating, um, and we got loads of people at the door, but nothing out of the ordinary. Are you a lover or a hater of Halloween? I, I like it, um, but I don't go mad. You know, I'm not one of these people that goes to you know to massive parties like all dressed up. But I do admire it. You know, when you see on um, Instagram, everyone's dressing up and spending yeah. a lot of money on it. I do wish I had more enthusiasm. <laughs> Are you uh, one of those parents that puts the sweets outside the door so that you don't have to answer the door? I did it. I did at the end, like, because it was like, (laughs) it was literally like every two minutes the door was going. I should have just stood out there. That would have been the easiest thing. (laughs) And then the kids are always like, take a handful. Some kids are like really nice. They take, uh, they take one. Um, But yeah, I think, I think I was done about 8.30 where I left the whole bucket out there. Yeah, I think it's quite dangerous. You leave the sweets out on the doorstep because the big kids just come and like empty it into the, yeah. into, into the bag, don't they? Right. Um, so can you introduce our guest today and why you wanted them on the podcast? So my guest today is Jamie Scott. He's the 2014 MasterChef winner. And, you know, I wanted to talk to, you know, the, the person, the chef that, that took the baton from me. Um, you know, from, from MasterChef. And, you know, I've been admiring Jamie's um, work that he's doing um, up in Scotland. I've, I've tried to get him to do a, a guest chef evening down at Edge, but I guess logistically, being literally polar opposites of the country uh, has, has proved difficult. But again, what's nice about social media is that you can keep an eye on chefs and see what they're up to. And like I said, Jamie has been going from strength to strength. I think he's got three operations on the go. He might correct me. It might be more now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's just exciting to see what happens as well to, to winners after the show. Brilliant. Uh, Jamie, Scott, welcome to Grills. Thank you very much, guys. Steve, you made a blush there. It was very, very nice of you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Bigging you up. I, I feel like uh, Stephen's using this as a list of people that he wants to come and cook at, at Etch. Is like a... we, had it, we had it sorted, didn't we? We had, we yeah. had it sorted right before, um, right before COVID hit. I was going to go down and do a wee um, a dinner for. I can't remember what happened. I think it was just as Stephen mentioned. It is logistically quite tough. Is um, especially because I'm quite I'm quite a fickle for my own ingredients and bring my own stuff down. So trying to work out how to bring all my own stuff down to this restaurant and then how much prep they would have. Yeah, it was pretty tricky, but I'm sure we'll make it happen one day, definitely. Oh, absolutely. I'm sure that you will. Um, so you haven't actually met each other before then. This is a kind of a, a first, as, as face-to-face as, as you've been. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So you're going to learn a lot about each other now as I get my my wheel out. Oh, you're making me nervous. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, so Jamie, very simple. Um, I will spin my wheel and uh, ask the question that it lands on. Um, Stephen or Jamie, who would like to go first? I think Jamie said he wants to go first. I oh, did. He? Okay. Definitely didn't say that, but I will go first. Like... <laughs> okay. Right. <laughs> Who is your favourite master chef judge? Oh my judge. Um <laughs> I, I think 
probably probably markets. Right. Is uh, I was the first. We were the first show with Marcus. Um, I think Stephen, yeah, Stephen was the last one with um, Michelle Rue Jr. So we were the first ones with Marcus. And I just remember I got the phone call from MasterChef just saying that we'd be getting a new judge. I'm like, oh, who would you like? And and who would like can it be your, your, your best judge to have and your worst judge to have? And I just remember that conversation. I remember like lying in the living room and I was just thinking, I'd love to have Tom Kerridge at the time because Tom had just kind of, the hand and flowers just blown up. He was kind of like the one everyone was watching. He just seemed like a really nice guy. He seemed like really honest. And I remember them asking, who would you least want? And it was Marcus Waring because <laughs> I think he got a bit of a bad rep off of um, Great British Menu. And the, the TV stuff he did right before, or maybe a couple of years before Masterchef, I don't think he came across as well um, as he probably would have wanted being a, being probably one of Ramsey's number ones. And I think it just came across bad, but he was great. He was so insightful. What they don't show you, what you don't see in the program is actually how, I don't know if this was the same with Steven, but when the judges are actually really, genuinely really helpful. They're, they, yes, they're, they're there to put pressure on you, but they're also there to give you a little tips and hints as you're going. They understand that it's your first time doing something this intense and in such a short time frame against other people in a, a, a brand new studio, which was bloody roasting, by the way, all the time because it's the middle of summer in London and I'm from Scotland. <laughs> it's never that warm here. Um, <laughs> but there, Mark is just like, he was just uh, dead honest. Um, it's easy for me to say as well because I was quite, I was on their good side, like probably like Stephen again. And I went in there with a couple of little mindsets and one was to work as tidy as possible. Um, two was to be as organised as possible, and three was to treat Monica, Greg, and Marcus as almost like my head chef walking in the kitchen, knowing that they're always checking on my stuff, knowing that they're always looking at what we're doing, just always working as as as, as, as uniform and as neat as possible. And I think that kind of went um, worked well with Marcus. Yeah. So you went from definitely not wanting Marcus to he's now your favourite favourite judge. Okay, good. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Right, Stephen. Something that you're glad your parents don't know about you. <laughs> um, well, this could, this could be the time to like spill the beans. I don't know whether they're actually going to listen to this, but um, when I was younger, uh, I just passed my driving test and I got I got done for drink driving. And um, it sounds horrible, but it was actually the, the next morning. So I went out, um, obviously got drunk. And the next morning I had to be up for work. And on my way into work, I got pulled over for having a tail light out. And um, yeah, it just escalated quickly. Um, it literally came down to blood tests because it was so close, which really frustrated me. But I didn't have the, uh, the balls to tell my parents at the time. Okay. And uh, I just said I sold the car and I was now walking to work. <laughs> um, so yeah, mum, dad, if you're listening, sorry. <laughs> Uh, how long was the ban? A year. I think <laughs> oh, at the time, so I was 17, I think it was like the time where they were really clamping down. And it is, looking back on it, it was a stupid thing to do and they're absolutely right to clamp down on it. I just felt like I was completely um, like made an example of. You know, um, it's, it's not like I got out, I was three times over the limit. And at the time, I got the same punishment as um as someone that was like four or five times over the limit that crashed into a roundabout <laughs> so I felt a little bit hard done by but it's uh, it taught me a valued lesson I do think that after the night out drinking and then mm. and then driving is something that you sometimes don't think about do you, you think oh well uh, I finished drinking hours ago I'll be absolutely yeah. fine and especially, especially at 17. Young, as a young person yeah yeah younger. you know it's you, you I was so naive, you like you 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 just don't think you're almost like, well, that happened last night. That's not that's not this morning. Um, but yeah. Yeah, Mr. You got me on that one, Cara. <laughs> Breathing fumes all over the policeman. <laughs> They're the Jaeger five hours ago. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, they may listen. You may have to hold your hands up. <laughs> right, Jamie. Jamie's doing all right here. A weird food combo that you enjoy. A weird food combo that I enjoy. Something you do when people are not looking. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I do anything too crazy nowadays, but I used to, like, for some odd reason, 
put vinegar on cheese and onion crisps. Right. I don't know why, but I remember I didn't want anyone to know. So I would sneak into the cupboard and I would get the vinegar and I'd hide behind the cupboard door and I'd shake the vinegar in, shake the bag and I'd eat them really quickly. <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea why. And also I really, really rate strawberry jam and cheese sandwiches. Oh, what? Again, it's, I think before... How did you- how did you even discover strawberry jam and cheese sandwiches? Cara, I honestly can't tell you, but <laughs> I remember I, I, one summer when I was maybe like 14 or 15, I was really at my golf and we used to, my mom and dad used to run the golf clubs and we stayed at the golf course and I got a summer job as a greenkeeper helping like rake the bunkers and mow the grass and stuff and I used to get like my my gran used to make me like a like a, like a packed lunch and it would be like jam and cheese sandwiches and I would get the absolute piss taken at me by all the greenkeepers in there who are all eating their bacon rolls and stuff and I'm just sitting there with my jam and cheese sandwich, not realizing, not knowing why it was so good. And to this day, <laughs> I still rate it. <laughs> I still rate it. <laughs> Stephen, have you tried to jam and cheese sandwiches? No, but I can relate to it. You know, we have um we have a cheese course. Uh, that's that's always on on the on the nine course menu, and we always pair it with um, fruit. I think it's like a northern thing, to be honest. But okay. credit to them, I think it works really well. You know, like especially like acidic fruits. You know, the richness of the cheese, the creaminess of it. Strawberry jam is sweet, yeah, a bit too sweet. But I can see how it could work. Yeah, but I'm talking like bog standard strawberry jam and <laughs> cathedral city so, <laughs> i'm not going to defend myself and say it's like aged comte with quince on it it's not it's 100 percent grated cathedral city a little bit too much butter and strawberry jam from from mckay's or something <laughs> i'm gonna have to try it now <laughs> well at least you, at least you're on it <laughs> And people now know why you're hiding behind covered doors as well, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've not done that in a long time. I'd like to put that on record. <laughs> I just had this vision of Jamie like behind the covered doors shaking the vinegar. <laughs> Honestly, I've no idea why. I don't know why it started. I think I must have wanted someone with a crisp one day and I thought I'd try it with cheese and onion. And it was all right. So, yeah, it's not well. Okay. Well, I wasn't expecting that, but yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, if you farted in a lift, would yeah. you say excuse me, or would you try and like blame it on someone else? <laughs> I would definitely blame it on someone else. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I reckon most people would, to be fair. Unless, I, unless they were my mates, and then I'd own it. Oh, okay, okay. So it would depend who you're in the lift with. Yeah, I think so. How honest you'd be. <laughs> Okay. What about you, Cara? <laughs> I don't fight in lifts or ever. <laughs> <laughs> but if you did. <laughs> yeah. All right, Jamie. Right, sure go. <laughs> Whose Instagram account would you like to control for a day? Um, do you know what? You probably know that I'm not massive on Instagram. I'm uh, more of a Twitter, a Twitter guy, but... Well, you can do Twitter instead if you want. Um, no, because it's not as juicy, is it? Probably, do you know what? Probably The Rock. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely love The Rock. So just to like, I'd like to be in control of his Twitter one day, maybe. You uh, want to see who comes into his DMs? I was going to say, imagine the DMs. <laughs> He's so good. Or like, just having his contacts, like who you could DM as well, um, would be quite good. Um, and Kanye West actually just to see what his is all about because he's a bit nuts <laughs> so I'd like to see what Kanye West is all about so um, that would be a very scary insight into a person's uh, brain and life I think yeah. Kanye wouldn't it yeah or if I was feeling really cheeky maybe like the royal family's like Instagram and, and maybe just go on and post loads of random stuff on there <laughs> watch the world burn around them because <laughs> what we used to, like I'd put pictures of jam and cheese sandwiches up telling everybody <laughs> yeah. or, or saying that one time that um, Prince Philip was in the lift it was him that farted or something just like, everyone knew how dirty they were <laughs> the real royal family yeah <laughs> Stephen is there an Instagram account you'd like to control 
that's a, it's a good it's a good probably someone that I don't like to be honest yeah and then uh then you could just post like random stuff but I think the royal family's got to win because I think that's a good one you could do like um you could do some really funny stuff to make it feel authentic but I was just thinking like a politician or something um you know it's quite heated at the moment with politics and you could uh, you can really stir some trouble up you could you definitely definitely could have some fun i reckon <laughs> right david when was the last time that you lied it's a hard one that probably to my kids i'm just trying to think like uh what, what i might have said to them <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, i'm gonna say it's like telling my kids that there's uh, that santa does exist that he doesn't exist he does he does you know, like, it's kind of like a white lie because we're getting ready oh, for okay, Christmas. Oh, okay, right, okay, you know. I'm with you now. Okay, so that's a nice one. I, did, I didn't yeah. say, I didn't say he does exist, but I didn't say he doesn't exist. I thought you'd so say, say doesn't exist, and say, aren't your kids little? That is harsh. <laughs> no, they're, they're, they're really excited for Christmas already. <laughs> now Halloween's gone, they're, they're straight on the Christmas bandwagon. Okay, okay, so a nice lie. you got to yeah. go a nice, a nice lie. Okay, yeah. right. <laughs> I feel like they squirmed out of that one. <laughs> well, I, try, I, I try not to to lie if that makes sense I always try and be be honest like you, that's why you got me on that one about my mum and dad um because uh you know I'd rather tell the truth and take the hit for it than uh than, than to lie yeah but I, I think white lies are okay aren't they yeah I think that's fine that's fine and it's good to know I like to know that you're an honest guy <laughs> well, thank you. right um, that's the end of those. You can uh, breathe a sigh of relief. They weren't so bad. <laughs> um, right, Jamie, uh, MasterChef The Professionals, we've kind of touched on it a little bit to do with obviously your, your favourite judge and stuff, but is it correct that you were on the reserve list the year before you actually did MasterChef? Is that right? Yeah. 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 So you could have been on with Stephen then, right? Yeah. So you could have actually won. <laughs> Nah, nah, definitely <laughs> one. <laughs> no, I am. Um, yeah, I actually, I'm actually quite good friends with Adam and Scott, who are both in Stephen's final as well, because I worked with Scott the year before he went on. So I was um, Scott's junior Sue when he was working before. But um, basically, what happened was the, the restaurant we were working at, they Scott had left and they were a little bit jealous. They wanted to enter our head chef on at the time onto master chef, but he didn't want to do it. So I was a sous chef at the time. So he said to go and enter me. So they went and enter, entered me and it came through on like the last day for the TV trials. When you go to, to Edinburgh to do the TV test, they phoned me up and said, Oh, just like, you know, we're on the waiting list because um, we've had enough applicants this year. If anybody pulls out, we'll give you a quick call and we can talk to you um, uh, via WhatsApp, whatever it was at the time. And, I said that was absolutely fine, but then I never heard back from them. And then the, the following year, the application got resubmitted and I got straight through to the to the TV things. But yeah, it could have been on the same year as Stephen, Scott and Adam. Um, that would be interesting, but I, I don't know. It was a very strong final, Stephen's year. Um, obviously, Stephen's a great chef. Scott Davies is one of the best cooks I know as well. Um, and you just look at kind of what Adam Hanlon's doing nowadays. You kind of look at that. That was kind of the one big final I'll always remember. No, I, th I think the final, I think, uh, you know, I am biased. I think it was a strong final because, and I think like Scott doesn't get, um, you know, he doesn't really like the limelight and he doesn't really get the credit that he deserves in that final. You know, he was the dark horse all the way, all the way through the competition. And like you said, um, Jamie, he's an amazing chef and it's reflected in what he's achieved um, after the show as well. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. For, for me, I had a weird... Um, a weird situation at the at the beginning of the show because you're you're basically you're grouped up, aren't you, into your, into your weeks with um, with the different chefs? And I think a week before I was due to go on, um, I got a phone call and it said, "Look, we've had someone, um, you know, change their plans. Can you sw switch with them?" So I got asked, "Would I switch with them and do the show tomorrow?" And I jumped at the chance to do that. Um, I don't know whether that was a good luck thing for me. I could have been in a different a different group at the beginning but I always think like when something like that happens I just I just go with it I see it as a sign well that could have been interesting then you're still still confident though Stephen 
Well, I don't know because it's the little things in, in any competition. It's the little things like you go on your, your own journey. And I'm sure Jamie will say the same thing that, that for me, I was very nervous at the beginning and I was kind of finding my feet in the competition. And as it went on, I felt I got stronger and stronger. Um, and the things that Jamie said about respect for the judges and taking on that feedback and learning from it was, uh, was what I was doing throughout. Jamie, what was the most significant impact winning MasterChef had on, on your life, do you think? I'm quite a firm believer if I would have got to this, to this, well, it's not this podcast, it would be a MasterChef, but without being a MasterChef, I would have got to where I wanted to be with my own restaurant um, and doing my own thing eventually, because that was my end goal anyway. It wasn't to go and work for someone else, it was to eventually be my own boss and to, to have my own kind of uh, journey that way. I think more, more, more than anything, it gave me a lot of confidence. Um, I knew I was a good cook, but it kind of gave me the belief that I was a, a better than a good cook. Um, it let me find my own identity for my own food because I don't know if Stephen, what Stephen thinks about this, but when you're working for other people, you're cooking their, their food and you can cook the best fish, you can cook the best meat, the loveliest purees, the best sauces, but it's always someone else's. And to, you really have to go out on your own to kind of find your own identity. And I found that when I was on the programme, I was being asked to do my own menus, my own dishes more. And I just found a bit more of a creative um, spark from it and doing that, even though I stitched myself up massively every single round, <laughs> I generally thought that I found my own kind of like niche or my own kind of um, um, cooking style when I was on it. And is there anything that you, uh, well, this is to both of you actually, that you would add or, or, or take away from the show to make it more watchable? I think they have changed up quite a bit since at least my show anyway. Um, was it your one, Stephen, when they did the service where you did individual orders for the chef's table? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that was horrible. <laughs> oh, my gosh, that does I sound remember, horrible. <laughs> I remember that format, and I remember not wanting that format, but then also not wanting the format I got when I had to cook for all, all 30, 34 of them as well. Um, I don't know. I think it's. I think it's always going to be trickier because... I don't think they emphasize how important it is to people on that program because they're very quick, like on the celebrity one of the or the amateurs, more for the most so for the amateurs, it is obviously life-changing, but I don't think it's emphasized how life-changing it is for a, a professional on that. And just how much is at risk? Because going back to what I said before about what I was thinking about going on to it and what kind of fundamentals of setting myself to be clean and tidy and um, to work really respectful, was I was also thinking, don't look like an idiot. I was thinking I've got, I was a like sous chef and I had 12 guys in me at a, a, a really good restaurant as I was on the show. And I was thinking, don't go and do something daft that will affect that. Because if you go back and you've done, like you serve raw pigeon or you've done something really stupid, you're just going to get them. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's, you've got to go back and kind of like reaffirm what kind of chef you are, how good you are when you go back. And I just think they need to emphasize it more and probably give some sort of price at the end of it, which they don't really do. Yeah, I mean, I suppose people don't, um, especially people that don't work in the industry, people who are watching it don't realise that that kind of that risk and that different sort of pressure that you will ultimately put on yourselves. I really do. I really I don't generally tend to watch it. Um, I normally tend to tune in kind of like the, the semi-final heats when I go to different restaurants and then the final. But um, I do find the the build up is a little bit it's quite a long, isn't it? Because there's so many obviously chefs on it. Yeah. I do quite enjoy watching the, the Australian version of it when they kind of bring in the, the, the Michelin star chefs and they have to do, cook against them and stuff. And that's quite good. I don't know how they would do that, but I think there needs a bit more interaction, a bit more, maybe, maybe less rounds or more um, exciting rounds. Because it's, it's difficult as well, because it always feels really exciting when you're on there and you're in the actual zone. Because I remember the, we did, I think we were the only one to do it. We did the 12 chefs all at the same time. Um, no kind of like frills cooking, no equipment just like cook something in two hours and I remember feeling it was really tense and really exciting and really really full on for the two hours we're in there and then we, I watched it back and it was just really really flat and a bit, a bit a bit boring watching it but I just remember feeling completely different at the time in the actual studio. Yeah. I'd like to see I know what Jamie means by you know it's 30 something contestants and it quickly whittles down to the final six or final four um, I mean, once he gets to the semi-final, what's that? It is, um, I think it's like eight or six. It's six, isn't it, in the semi-final? Mm -hmm. Once he gets down to those six chefs, the competition really changes. Like, that's where the judges start loving you, I felt, and they start nurturing you. 
Um, but I would actually like to see like the interview stage on the show. I think, you know, like on X Factor where you get someone that can't sing and um, it actually becomes quite funny to see the yeah. judge's reaction. I'd like to see that, you know, like more contestants at the beginning that like have to quickly do a dish and then uh, Monica's just like, that's inedible and throws yeah. it in the bin or, you know, I don't know, something a bit more like, uh, and that's why I agree with Jane. I think at the beginning it's, it's almost just going through the stages, whereas I think it could be a bit more exciting. I think that the best round, isn't it, it's like watching it is the skills test. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and obviously there's only so many skills you can show and do doing it for so many years. Mm. But that's like, that's the most exciting bit or the most watchable bit I find, especially. Um, and it is horrible being in there when when you go in. I don't know, we were the, that was our second, that was our second test where I think they swapped it around now. So it was the first which would be even worse now. But um, yeah. that kind of, yeah, you're right. Like, that kind of thing works work really well. I don't know if you could do more challenges based on that. That would be a bit more exciting because as you said, Stephen, when you get to a certain stage, I found the last couple of years when we watching it, it's when it gets to kind of like the final 10 or even eight, you do have a generally really strong cooks in there. And I don't think they're pushed out of the comfort zone as much the further they get on. Mm. I think it gets a little bit more because you get more comfortable in the kitchen you get more comfortable with the judges and, and the camera guys following you and the sound men following you. You know where the equipment is. And I think they need to, I think the pressure dies down a little bit um, because you've almost kind of not necessarily made it, but you've done well enough to be known of. You're a semi-finalist or you're a finalist on it. And it's it's kind of it kind of puts you at ease a little bit. So I think there needs to be a bit more um, pressure in those, those areas. What skills test would you set, Jamie, if you could set one and why? Uh, oh, I'm trying to think of one that's not been done. I had a really easy one. I was very lucky. I got like just the bone and roll bit of pork and stuff it. That was quite easy. I remember watching one of my favorite ones to watch was Monica's one when she told them to make a souffle in 15 minutes, which was absolutely ridiculous. And when you see it, you can, it obviously it can be done, but it's ridiculous. It's like not something you'd do ever in 15 minutes. But I think, um, oh, skills. do you know what? I'd like to see them make an omelette. I think three, well, we have three kind of fundamentals when you come in our kitchen. So when you come in, we like you to, we want you to be able to chop chives very well. Bruno has a carrot, a, a celery and a shallot. And we want you to make a three egg omelette. Now there's no time scale to that. We just want to see how you do it. And it's, it's just to let us know kind of where you are and how you work, because we find these are quite fundamentals in our kitchen. So maybe make a great omelette and like, like the omelette was like an omelette challenge, but like, just like these little things, like seasoning it well. And you can imagine how many chefs can make a crap omelette or just not do it properly. I think I'd probably like to see that or something maybe from that level to then something more extreme, maybe like bone out a pig's trotter or a pig's head, mm -hmm. uh, which we do quite a lot here. I think you have to go back to the fundamentals um, and really test people. Do you think with an omelette, a lot of chefs would be like, I'm not just going to make an omelette, I'm going to do something with the, would they try and do more than they probably need to do, do you think, with something that's so simple like that? Yeah, again, it depends, it depends on what you would call it, probably say is, is, is making it better, isn't it? I suppose if you give them a list of ingredients or a set of ingredients they could do to make a really great omelette, um, it would be it would be good if you made like a beautiful like omelette of like seps or something, just really simple or... If they started going mad and putting tomatoes, like, you know, when you go to like a holiday buffet and there's an omelette station and you get a little bowl and you get a spoonful of absolutely everything and there's a lady in front of you with like peppers, olives, onions, ham, cheese, do you know what I mean? <laughs> absolutely everything. This poor guy yeah. has got one, yeah, <laughs> this poor guy chopped hot dogs from the buffet from the kids station. <laughs> this poor guy has got this tiny little egg pan and there's more ingredients and the eggs he's got and he's trying to whisk it all and it's just like you can imagine somebody doing that as well but I feel like we've just created a new slot on MasterChef <laughs> to professionals like the omelette station sounds amazing yeah I just think yeah I think it, as I said it's quite tricky to, to to pinpoint what they've not what they haven't done but something really basic like that or um yeah because it's, it's only 15 minutes as well as i think it'll be about 25 minutes sometimes but i always remember the omelette with the um the souffle one it's been so funny i'm sure that you are more than happy never to go back and do that skills test around ever again on television <laughs> no, i wouldn't mind that i think it'd go on and I'd hopefully i'd get a repeat of something or i just know it but yeah, yeah. That, was, that was very fun that one but there's nothing worse though is when you get has to do something and you do know what it is but your mind just goes completely blank and I think we talked about this last time didn't we Stephen like there's 
it's just awful you know you know it but you just can't think of what it is and I bet that happens to a lot of people under those circumstances so yeah, yeah. What, was um, that, what was your Stephen what was your skills test Mine was to cook a whole Dover, well, it wasn't to cook a whole Dover sole, but it was to cook a portion of Dover sole with uh, a brown butter sauce, which I loved. I cooked the whole fish, which uh, Monica grilled me on, but um, I still stand by my decision. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was thinking like a taste test, because you, you see it on the amateurs, they do a taste test. I think that you could you could have fun with it. Like, you know, when you said about the trotters, I just thought, I thought about Pierre Kaufman doing up his trotter dish, and then the, the chef has to eat it blindfolded, say what it is and what they think of it. And yeah. I just had a thought of like a chef saying something random and then offending Pierre Kaufman and then mm-hmm. lifting off their uh, their face mask. Yeah, or even recreating the dish or something from blind. Yeah, that, that uh, could be quite a good one. Recreate a classic dish using this. I think, did we have to do that? I'm just trying to think. There might have been something where we had to follow a recipe. I don't know whether they don't do it in the Master Chef professionals now. No. Because you know, like everyone follows a recipe differently. I'm yeah. sure we had to do it in one of the rounds and everyone presented food looking completely different. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's that that was that's a good one. I always enjoyed the scraps test as well. I think you guys yeah. were the first one to do that. We we really enjoyed the scraps test. I just think I just think there's the the, the more imaginative rounds are a bit earlier in the competition. I think it can it gets a little bit or cook something great, or cook something, cook like use yeah. these ingredients and cook something great with that. It just gets a little bit monotonous by the end of it. Yeah, no, 100%. Well, uh, the MasterChef professionals, uh, producers can thank us for all of these ideas later. <laughs> so, <laughs> when you see it next year, you know where it's come from. Um, don't look worried, but when I type your names into Google, um, both of you uh, are referred to often as celebrity chefs. Do you feel like a celebrity? You got me really worried when you said you typed my name into Google. I know, I was sorry, like, I what's, what's gonna get? What's going to come up? Now <laughs> I'll just yeah. come up with Stephen Edwards, drunk driver. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking. I, I personally don't see myself as a celebrity. I see myself as a chef with a restaurant. Um, but it, I think I said it on the last podcast, there is that... that a horrible situation where you go from like being you, you are like a celebrity on uh, like the day after and then from that point it just goes down and down and down all the way back to normality I mean it's nice to get recognized um now and again but I don't know what letter of the alphabet is after Z but that's where I'd put myself <laughs> I don't know about J- Jamie um no, I don't. I don't like the term. I don't like the term at all. You, you, as Stephen said, you start off like I remember going down to London um, when I was in the quarter, when I was in the semi-finals. I just got to the last twelve, I think it was the last ten, and I went down to London with my own dad and my my, my wife, my, fiance, my wife at the time, still my wife, but <laughs> she was my wife at the time. I, was, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know how you messed that up. <laughs> Uh, sending you a message after Cara. I know the four of us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, the, no, the four of us went down. I remember the four of us going down, and it was on. It was well. It was on TV, and I remember like people recognising the training and stuff. And then they're thinking, "Oh, that'll be it," because Scotland's tiny, isn't it? <laughs> and there was only there was only a few of us in Scotland. But I remember getting to London, and I remember like not being able to walk anywhere without somebody pointing or coming over or saying something. And that was just when I was in the the quarterfinals, the semifinals it was. And I remember standing, I went to um, like the Christmas festival and we're standing in one of the big beer tents and there was like a group of office staff working there, like standing there like drinking, there was like 12 or 15 of them. And like, they came over like, hey, Jamie, Jamie off Master Chef. I'm like, yeah, like we buy you a drink. And they almost, they almost have bought like me, my mom and dad and my wife, like beer all night and just kept buying us drinks. And it was honestly just from absolutely nothing. I didn't know what to say, I would see these people. And it was just really surreal. And I remember, Maybe me being a bigger fish in a smaller pond up in Scotland was a little bit. It was it lasted a little bit longer, um, but it was quite. It was quite nice. It's nice. Do you know what it's nice? It's nice to get invited to do things a lot more. Um, as Stephen said, it's nice to get recognised. It's nice to have a bit of a podium for opening a restaurant or for doing something like that. Um, and it's also it gives you a little bit of a stance when you're kind of when people want to come work for you, um, which is quite nice. But I don't necessarily describe myself as a celebrity chef, even though I've done a bit of TV since. Um, I just I just like being a chef that's done some TV work. It's, it's much yeah. better. I think I think Ainsley 
Big Ainsley's the only really celeb <laughs> chef that d- deserves that title. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's more for those people that I think don't have a restaurant or don't have that mm. that weekly, daily, yearly grind that go and they just kind of base the work on TV or books. They just do that solely. I think that's what yeah. I would class as a celebrity chef, that they would do all those things and not have a restaurant to worry about. But when you're doing two or three TV performances a year, but you're in the restaurant the other 12, 12 months of the year, I think it's um, there's just a small difference there. Yeah. Do you enjoy it? Do you enjoy doing TV? Um, I do, actually. Yeah, I do. I, I, do you know what it is, Cara? I understand what it does. I understand that it's good for the restaurant. I understand it's good for um, getting people on seats. I understand it's good for the brand. Um, so I like doing it like that. I don't particularly like doing it for myself. I don't gain any, get anything out of it personally. Um, but I do quite like it. It's a bit, do you know what I mean? It's almost like a day off almost. You go down and you got to be there a couple hours early. You do a shoot and then you're there for an hour and then you leave and there's a couple hours early. So it's nice getting a day off when you should be at work more mm-hmm. than anything. But um yeah, it's, it's quite it's, it's quite nice. I've done some fun stuff. I went to McAllen Distillery and we cooked in like with all the big stills and all the pots and stuff. Um, and I was surrounded by like a million pounds worth of whiskey. That was really good fun. And I was cooking a steak in like, where well, they shouldn't be cooking a steak because there's that much yeah. flammable liquid. So I've done some fun stuff in the past, but um, I, I don't like see myself as ever doing it as a career or doing it like professionally. Again, uh, J- Jamie um, hit the nail on the head. You know, you see the effects that it has um, on the business, on the restaurant in a, in a positive way. I think it's it's just, you know, when you look at a business plan and you've got like marketing, it's, it's that's essentially what it is. Mm. And um, you need to market your restaurant and, and yourself and your, your own brand in a certain way. Um, because especially with the amount of restaurants now to have, to have that USP, I think it, it gets people in. It gets the bums on seats. I mean, while while Jamie was talking, I was actually thinking back to your to your last question as well. I I think they should do a live Master Chef final. Okay. <laughs> no, but like that, you know, like almost like the I think the Apprentice does like a live final and, and, and other shows. I mean, they would probably hate it, the filming of it, but imagine the pressure yeah. on uh, on that and to to actually see it. I think would yeah. be even take it to another level. Even splitting the vote, like the final vote with like a, like a public vote or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because it, obviously, obviously the, you want the winner to be the best chef, but some most of the finals I've seen are very close and you can really, it's not necessarily the best chef that's winning, is it? It's the best like food on the day. I know they do take into account how strong they've been the whole time, but it'd be really good to see what the public thought or what they were, who they yeah. really to more as well. It'd be quite fun if that was like half the vote or something and then... Greg Wall, uh, Greg, Monica, and Marcus were other half, and had to put it together. We're definitely going to call up about this, Stephen. By the way, and if future MasterChef contestants who end up on a live final have got both of you to to thank for this. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking of which, actually, um, which if you could pick a chef each uh, that you're aware of that you that you follow or that you know, um, who would you like to see on MasterChef if you could put them on there as a contestant? I would love to see, um, he's not a chef, but I'd love to see Greg Wallace go through the stages. <laughs> I think it'd be funny. I just, because no, he must have watched enough of them. It would be uh, TV gold, I think, to watch him up against uh, other professional chefs and see how well he does. I feel like that's a bit of a kind of, you know, the Ant and Deck, is it the Saturday night thing that they do where they dress people up so they yeah. don't look like, so they could, he, they, yeah, they could put him in there. <laughs> Definitely. As a pretend professional chef and yeah. see how far he can get. Yeah. <laughs> we should we need to we should have alternative jobs here. I feel like we're creating amazing uh, TV gold right now. <laughs> okay. It so- would be I mean it would be interesting to see like four or five like top chefs go through that process and see how they do. Mm-hmm. Because I think you know we've covered it with you know, as as a chef, you don't know everything. But to the to the person at home watching TV, they're like, "How does that chef not know that? Or how how have they messed that up?" I think it'd be interesting to see, you know, like top top class chefs going through that process and seeing how their mind works and see them get judged. Yeah, we see that, you, see, you see it a little bit on Great British Men, don't you? When they're yeah, the balls in a dish that they've already known they're going to be doing and they've been practicing so many times, and the excuse is that the kitchen's hot. Do you, do you know what I mean? And like, yeah, yeah. I remember my first round, um, I cooked the wrong dish my first my, my first day. Um, I got I submitted my my recipes, 
and they mixed up the main courses. So we had to submit the signature dish, which was the first one we did. And then we, we had to submit the critics dishes, which was the two courses, obviously with different time scales. And they mixed up my main courses. So I, I went in to do the um, to do the mise en place with the home economist, and she brought out this um, this duck, uh, this turbot, sorry. And I was thinking, I'm doing duck today. I've got I've got like an hour an hour forty five to cook a nice duck dish. I was like, I'm doing duck. Um, and like, no, you're doing turbot. You're doing turbot today. I was like, no, I'm not, I'm not doing turbot. I was like, my timing for my turbot's half an hour for the critics. And it was literally a beautiful bit of turbot that was going to be um, roasted with chicken fat, served with a chicken sauce, sea vegetables, and uh, roasted um, rolls at a time. And they gave me that dish. So I had to do that in, in an hour and 45 minutes. And then I had to go to the critics and then do a duck dish that was meant to take an hour and 45 minutes, plus do the four desserts. <laughs> and I just remember thinking, this isn't right. And they couldn't change it. And that's what I had to do. So, um, as I said, like I put in, like Stephen said, putting somebody like kind of like that's at the top of their game or like top class in that situation where they have no idea what they're going to be doing or no idea what the situation is and seeing how they react would be really good. Yeah, no, I think that would be quite. How many of them do you think would volunteer to do that though? <laughs> Um, yeah. I mean, my, my lifelong long, uh, dream is to have like a like a professional chef come dine with me, which I think would actually be better. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we're covering all of the cooking sure programs sure right sure now. Oh, okay. but I love come dine with me is my favorite my favorite cookery program. I just is love it. it. It is because it's Why relaxed. It? It's, it's just chilled out. Like when I watch Master Chef the Professionals, I feel like. The emotions are coming back. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. when I get back from work, I, I just want to relax. And I think with um, with come dine with me and Dave Lamb doing the voiceover, I think it's just hilarious. But I'd like to see professional chefs. You know, like you know, like um, Gino, Gino, Fred, and uh, Gordon have that show. Imagine I don't know, like Gordon Ramsay, Marcus Waring, and a couple of other chefs okay. having a come come dine with me. It'd be, it'd be ego, it'd be ego driven as well. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Plus, you get a little nosy around the houses, don't yeah, you? Yeah, hundred percent. I did uh, ask Stephen this before, but uh, so I'll, I'll ask you, Jamie. Um, is there any stories from behind the scenes that the viewers didn't see that really stand out from your time on MasterChef? Going back to that round where it was the twelve chefs on the same kitchen at the same time. I think one of the most common questions I get asked is, "Do they ever like what? How how hot is the food when the judges taste it?" And I always remember like thinking, obviously it's cold, but I remember I was like the ninth or tenth chef in that program that episode, and my food would be sat there for two hours and thirty five minutes, and I remember just looking at it and it just like it just looked so sad, and you always not to do anything. I remember my sauce had like congealed in the jug. And I did like a, a braised octopus with um, like pork belly done in the pressure cooker, um, white beans and a kind of someone else on the plate. And I remember taking up to Monica and it, everything was just so cold and static on the plate. I put it down and like everyone was hard. And I went to pour the sauce and the, the, all the sauce just went <laughs> right on top of it. A congealed mess, right? And Monica had like, she could not cut through it because it was so cold. And she eventually took a bit of it and cold octopus, cold pork belly, congealed sauce and white beans obviously don't taste that great cold. She just yeah. turned around and kind of like spat into the bucket. Oh, God. <laughs> but she said it was really good. But I think it was just like they'd eaten 15 plates before that of cold food already. And we were just getting to the end because Danny had given them, who was in the program as well, had given them venison and beetroot and they struggled to eat that. And then... I remember it was like heavy dishes after me. It was just, it just got all worse and worse and worse. And it was like literally two hours and 35 minutes and he's staring at a plate. And I also remember in the, in the scrap challenge, um, I was on with Sven, who got to the final with me. Um, he's one of the best, best chefs I've ever met. He's superb. And he did this beautiful pot of foo dish with like all the chicken offal and stuff. Um, and then I did like a, a ravioli of pork knuckle with like a broth and pickled broccoli. And then there was two other guys in our round because we had lost an extra guy because he'd cut himself. So it was just the four of us. And these two other guys were just absolute donuts. They, were, um, they weren't the best. And I remember one guy had like a combination puree of like broccoli, cauliflower, and carrot. 
right? So where this idea came from, I had no idea. But what he'd done was he'd, he'd used the, the, the dark green, like frizzy on Dave Lett sleeves, which you don't use ever. And he'd used that as a garnish. And I remember Mark, Mark is just absolutely grilling him about it, saying, why would you do that? Why would you do that? And the guy behind him, who was going last, had this one perfect little dark green frizzy lettuce sleeve on top of his banana and chicken fried rice. <laughs> and his biggest worry at the time was to pull that off. And I remember the cameraman was just like, Slapping his hand every time he went near it. So never mind about the fucking banana and chicken fried rice. He was worried about this on the leaf on top of it. And every time he went to move it, the cameraman said, you can't touch that, you can't touch that. And I was honestly in tears, absolute <laughs> tears laughing because I couldn't handle it. And then, of course, Marcus goes round and just looks at the on the leaf and picks up his fork. They just flicks it away <laughs> and then what the banana fried rice. Just like a, just absolute car crash, but that was one of my favourite bits on it. See, they're the bits that we want to see, aren't uh -huh. they? <laughs> I was quite lucky. Again, going back to the guy that cut himself as well, he seemed quite good, but basically it was in the signature test and he had a rough first two rounds. And he was a really nice guy. I can't remember his name. He's from Newcastle, a lovely guy. And he, um, he basically knocked his paring knife and it had fallen between the cooker and the tabletop. And the knife was sticking through the gap like that. And he just turned around and, and kicked his shin into it. And the knife had went into his shin. And the, he didn't notice, right? And then about half an hour, 45 minutes in, he just touched his leg and he pulled up his hand. There was like blood all over his hand. And I was working right across and I was like, are you all right? <laughs> He's like, no, I've cut myself. And he lifted his leg up a little bit quite a deep gash in his leg, and he just collapsed. <laughs> it was like a tree falling down. He's like a big guy, and it's like fucking timber. Collapsed, right? And Greg's like, realised what's going on, and he's like, Greg standing at the front, he's like, right guys, please continue. Please continue. This will not affect your time. You have to continue. And I was just watching him, like, cutting like that. What is going on? And he gets lifted up in a wheelchair, and then they wheel him out, and they're like, right guys, such and such is going to get wheeled at the back door if you can just make a shocked face look as you're going. And there was that. <laughs> and he gets wheeled in a wheelchair. We'll never see him again. It's like someone at a squid game. Do you know what I mean? Like, never see him again. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that was, quite, um, that was quite a good one for me. So. Yours sounds very uh, dramatic behind the scenes. Stephen, I'm pretty sure yours wasn't that dramatic, was it? I'm just trying to think what else happened. I mean, I can remember like Greg having to do the, the, the voiceover bits, like the 10 minutes left calls. So it'd be like, he'd do it though without it being 10 minutes left. <laughs> so you'd, like, you'd have like 20 minutes left. It'd be like, guys, I'm just going to call 10 minutes left, but it's not for 10 minutes left. And then 10 minutes later, he calls 10 minutes later. It's, it's really off put. There's a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. Um, that is quite off putting. Like every time you open the oven, you've got to leave it open for longer so they can shove a camera in there. Yeah. Um, and see see what's going on. Sometimes you open the oven and you burn something, so you just quickly shut it <laughs> and uh don't open it again. But you do <laughs> as Jamie said, you get used to you get used to the cameramen, like the the videographers, like you kind of know what they're looking for. So you can be quite clever as you go on through the competition you know that they want that sort of like TV gold of you pulling, you know, something out of the oven that's burnt or running to the blast chiller. We keep saying it, but that's that's what they love shooting. Mm. Before we go, I've got some questions from the audience, if that's all right with you two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> OK, so uh, they're all from Instagram. Um, Dan Wade, who I, I know, Stephen, you're aware of, and you, you're going to know what this is because it's his favourite question to ask people. Um, what is your favourite Justin Bieber song? <laughs> That's, That's the Jamie, surely. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Jamie. Oh, I can name one. Um... Don't lie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, str I'm struggling to think. I was going to say, like, Baby, but um, that's the only one I do know. But, like, maybe I'd say one of his more recent songs. Right. But you just can't think what that is. I don't know what, but... Do you know, do you know the name, Cara? I'm having one of them blank moments where if it comes on, I probably know all of the words, but I can't think what the what the songs uh, are actually called. I don't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> Is that poster of Justin Bieber behind you? <laughs> oh behind the wheel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What's the wheel hiding? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it'll be one of his newer songs. Uh, I think, is that like, I've got a couple of girls in the kitchen who love Justin Bieber and insist on playing them sometimes in the Sonus. So probably like, 
as long as you love me or something. Rubber toe four. Uh, do you have a budget that you have to stick to for Master Chef dishes, or can you just have and use whatever you like? Yeah, um, <laughs> there wasn't no, there wasn't there wasn't a budget as such. We just got told there were some things we couldn't use. I don't think. Well, my one I remember we weren't allowed to use truffle. Um, obviously, anything out of season we weren't allowed to use, but we didn't generally get a budget because. Okay. I think more, I've seen more going on in, in this episode since, the season since I've been on it, people bringing in the more, I think they'll be allowed to bring in their own stuff. Okay. I'm, I'm sure I've seen people bringing in Wagyu and people bringing in preserves and stuff recently. Um, whereas we didn't have that when I was on it. It was just a case of, here's your dish. They did want you to use, the only thing was though, like if you wanted to use turbot, they would get you the smallest turbot they could find because they didn't want to buy a whole turbot. So like you're, yeah, you'd be left. You'd have to use a whole set of turbot for one portion. I remember that um, because whatever they didn't use, they went to the home economist and they would use for the staff lunch and stuff. So we didn't have a budget as such. There's no budget, and I think I'm sure Adam Handling broke the records for the most money spent. Even though they don't total it up, but he was like getting like piglet bellies, or I think he needed like a whole whole piglets for one of his dishes. Okay. And they're like, what, what do you need the whole piglet for? And he's like, oh, I'm going to take the belly and then I'm going to use the rest for something else. Or so, like lobsters, everything. I was like in awe of what was coming in for him. <laughs> but literally, you know, because you do the check. So you do your check of your ingredients before you go on. So you, yeah. you're happy. So the home economist, you go for everything. And I'm there looking at Adam's uh, ingredients. I'm like, why did I not choose that? Yeah, they've, they've like started using, there's a lot more dry ice and a lot more liquid nitrogen and stuff on it nowadays as well than when I was on it because maybe we were just think, weren't thinking that at the time, but there was I, I noticed a lot more of that happening as well. Um, I remember Brian in the final of our one used a whole piglet as well, like a whole suckling pig, to get like saying one portion of food out of it. So you know, like where is that coming from? And fair enough, he made the bit of everything. He made like black pudding and stuff, and he used the loin, the belly. I think he used the cheek as well, but you still got. 95% of the pigs still there somewhere kicking about. <laughs> well, uh, knowing Adam, I'm not surprised by, by that, Stephen. <laughs> yeah, Actually, I've point. got a question on here that's would you rather be wrapped in cling film or foil? That's just reminded me. <laughs> <laughs> cling film. <laughs> foil. <laughs> right, final question from uh, Cray Treadwell, which is a bit away from MasterChef, which is fine. So um, where do you see yourselves in 10 years? I know that's quite a difficult question, um, but uh, Jamie, do you want to go first? Where, where do you see yourself in 10 years' time? Uh, retired. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, uh, COVID made me really, really, really think about what I did as um, kind of what to do as a cook and and that basically how much I love hospitality as well. So probably the same as Stephen, I've been offered other restaurants or I've been offered to go and do stuff in other cities or do other stuff at hotels and have my name on stuff and that. And it's just not really appealed to me um, because the Newport, I've got it to a really good place of where I wanted to be and I just really enjoy being here. So I don't see myself replicating the style of food we do here or, or diluting that anywhere else. It's just my opinion. So I've really explored kind of different versions of hospitality since we've had the lockdowns and stuff and I found myself enjoying them just as much as the restaurant or even even more um, and just enjoying the whole of hospitality as, as, as in general so like we've since lockdown we've opened um, the bakery we've got two shops now for that we moved it from the small production up to like a bigger production scale we've got 10 bakers I see that going further and maybe there are another couple of shops doing that We've got a really cool kind of uh, coffee house called Daily Grind, which is another kind of one of my big interests, which is like tattoos and rock music combined with like really nice food and coffee. We see ourselves maybe open a couple more of them, hopefully one more at the end of the year. That'll be a style, but it'll be three and a year and a half we'd opened. And then I really, really dislike supermarkets since the lockdown. So I really want to do something that would kind of take on a supermarket in a retail space. So in 10 years' time, hopefully a few more bakeries, a few more coffee shops, and some sort of Jamie Scott supermarket, I think it'd be good. <laughs> Mate, that is the dream. <laughs> yeah, I just, yeah, I think um, I think they got found out quite a bit over, through the lockdowns and stuff, and I think um, they didn't cover themselves in glory, and they got the monopoly, didn't they, of everything, because one of my good friends owned a lovely cheese shop in Dundee, and he got criticised for staying open and providing cheese and wine and breads, 
and he just had such a good argument. So why should Tesco stay open? Why should why should these shops get all the monopoly of what we're doing when we're trying to survive and, and be at home and stuff? And I had the same kind of thought about the bakery because when they announced the lockdown, I just went into kind of survival mode. I was like, right, I've got a bakery. It's only it's just open me two weeks. It's only open weekends, but I can go and run that five days a week. And after three weeks, we we're doing 500 deliveries a week. So we just like, we just had to go into a different mode and we were still getting told we shouldn't be open because we're not essential, like there's a co-op there or we shouldn't be doing that. You're putting people at danger. And I was like, well, no, we're not. We're supplying 500 different houses with bread, milk and eggs a week that they can't leave their house. Um, and I just think hospitality really did well um, during lockdown. It's, it's had a bit of a kicking now, but during the lockdown, when it was doing the boxes at homes, the... The, the, the meals for the homeless, which are doing Glasgow a lot, they were doing charity stuff, they're doing all that, and they're coming together. I think it did really well, and just inspired me to do other things. Right, well, I look forward to seeing the seeing the James Scott supermarket. I hope you have a good like loyalty scheme. I want one of them good support cards. <laughs> oh, definitely, definitely. <laughs> Stephen, what about you? Where do you see yourself in ten years? I just want like a collection, uh, not as big as James is, but I definitely want a pub and. Um, yeah, I just want I just want to have that, that spectrum of like a la carte restaurant, pub, taste a menu restaurant, uh, potentially a coffee shop, although that doesn't interest me too much. But just like a nice quality collection that I kind of see myself moving between the, the sites and and hopefully, you know, things just being normal. Like I do I do think after MasterChef, things like sped up so much. Um, and obviously during lockdown, I want to spend time with the family. I almost I want to build something that enables me to have time with my family and friends. Yeah. Nice it's probably step. the shortest answer version of that question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it's always good to aspire to have a, be- a good work-life balance isn't it? and get it the right way around. So I don't think that's a, not a bad answer. So, right. Well, that is it. You've made it, Jamie. You made it through. <laughs> I definitely got off light with the questions. Thank you, Stephen, for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're good. <laughs> Um, thank you both so much. Uh, Jamie, hopefully I'll catch up with you soon. Um, Stephen, I will see you again for our next uh, our next podcast. Um, but thank you both, um, and I'll speak to you soon. Absolute thank pleasure. You. Thank you, Cara. Cheers, guys. Thank you so much. <laughs>